We're living in an era of endless innovation where things constantly change. If you want to be terrified, over the next five years, half of all jobs will disappear in the U.S. If you want to be excited, that means a whole new world full of opportunity where no one has a head start on you. So why not go and do what you want to do? Why not live the life that you want? If you're going to a job that doesn't satisfy you, where they pay you enough to show up and not enough to care, unless you believe in reincarnation, you got one shot. And why not try to live a life of purpose? I believe the purpose of life is to, is to have a purpose for what you're trying to do. And so I'm dedicating what years I have left to teach people how to do it. The following is brought to you by Thrive, the end-to-end -end client experience platform that helps you get the job, manage the job, and get credit. Welcome to Winning on Main Street. This is Gordon Henry, and today we're speaking with Jay Samet, one of today's great business minds. He focuses on disruption and innovation in business. Jay's an entrepreneur and international best-selling author. His book, Disrupt You, has been translated to 12 languages, and his latest book is Future Proofing You, 12 Truths for Creating Opportunity, Maximizing Wealth, and Controlling Your Destiny in an Uncertain World. Jay's the former independent vice chairman of Deloitte Consulting, He's helped grow pre-IPO companies such as LinkedIn, been a NASDAQ company CEO, held senior management roles at EMI, Sony, and Universal Studios, and performed pioneering breakthrough advancements in areas like mobile, e-commerce, digital distribution, and spatial reality, used by consumers every day. Welcome, Jay. Thanks for having me. It's uh, fantastic to have you on. I, I uh, am really excited to talk because I've read your book and, and seen some of your talks and, and just fascinating stuff. So here we go. Let's start with the basics. Sure. What is disruption and why should we care? Um, well, for years I've been telling everybody, whether by choice or circumstance, every career gets disrupted. Post pandemic, I don't have to make that argument anymore. Uh, we're living in an era of endless innovation where things constantly change. If you wanna be terrified, over the next five years, half of all jobs will disappear in the US. If you wanna be excited, that means a whole new world full of opportunity where no one has a head start on you. So I tend to focus on the positive. And our educational system was designed to create factory workers, enough reading, enough writing to work someplace to make someone else's dreams come true. Well, those jobs are gone. We now, American factories since 1982 have tripled their output with one third the number of employees. So why not go and do what you want to do? Why not live the life that you want? If you're going to a job that doesn't satisfy you, where they pay you enough to show up and not enough to care, unless you believe in reincarnation, you got one shot. And why not try to live a life of purpose? I believe the purpose of life is to, is to have a purpose for what you're trying to do. And so I'm dedicating what years I have left to teach people how to do it. If you would have told me growing up that dozens of friends would become self-made billionaires, I would have asked you what you were smoking. <laughs> and I grew up an inner city kid in Philadelphia. I didn't know what a millionaire was. And yet, Disrupt You changed lives all over the world. I, I humbly say I've heard from people in 140 countries. I didn't do the work. They did it, okay? They changed their lives. But occasionally, and usually from a millennial, I hear this is motivational, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> so this time, I put my reputation on the line. I took an immigrant who grew up on welfare, mentored him one day a week. I gave him no cash, no introductions, and he had to start a business that took zero capital. And spoiler alert for people reading this, uh, uh, Future Proofing You, he became a self-made millionaire in 11 months. Hmm. And I show people how to do it. You've read the book. There's nothing that's rocket science. There's nothing you go, ooh, this is like trigonometry. I can't handle this. It's just, we haven't been shown how every 48 hours, someone becomes a self-made billionaire. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about Future Proofing You and that whole story with the immigrant who makes a million dollars in just one second. But first, I just want to ask you, can any business be disrupted? Should everybody be thinking, this is going to apply to me? Every business will be disrupted. You think of the obvious stuff like you're a truck driver, they're self-driving trucks. AI systems are going to replace lawyers and accountants and middle management. Uh, you know, how we grow our foods has to change because of, of climate change. Uh, 
there's endless new areas of innovation. So what got you to the C-suite isn't going to keep you there. And the mm -hmm. life expectancy of CEOs of public companies now is just slightly longer than Brie cheese. I mean, <laughs> you get an expiration date when the board puts you in there, which is part of the problem. And for, but the opposite is equally true. The infrastructure's there. We hold a device in our pocket more powerful than all the computers NASA had to put a man on the moon. And yet you can use it to connect to 7 billion potential customers or you can watch a hamster eat a tiny taco. The choice is yours. So what do you say to a 50 year old guy who's you know, a coal miner, a newspaper reporter? You know, you're saying these companies are gonna go away or these businesses are gonna be disrupted but they're mid to late stage in their career. What do they do to reinvent or pivot? Well, they're mid to late stage in their prior career. They're day one of their new career. Mm. Whoever you were when you went to bed yesterday, you don't have to be tomorrow. And you have wisdom that you've learned in any job walking around this planet that someone of 19, 20, 25 doesn't have. So I'd say to that person, do you have problems in your life? If you do, you're halfway to success because all that success is, is seeing that problems are opportunities in disguise. Entrepreneurs don't sell things, they solve things. If you ever think about it, nobody ever went into a hardware store wanting to buy a quarter inch drill bit. What they wanted was a quarter inch hole. They mm. bought the drill bit. So mm. what are problems that you have? If you solve it for five people, you're popular and you have friends. So solve for a million, you make money. Solve for a billion, you change the world. And what the pandemic also showed us is you don't have to be in a major city. You don't have to be in a first world country. You can work from anywhere and connect into this digital world. And you don't have to be an engineer. Steve Jobs created the first trillion dollar company. You wrote as much code as he did. Mm hmm but what he did was seek opportunity. So you need so, two things to be successful, insight yeah. and perseverance. Everything else can be hired. Mm. So you talk about in Future Proofing you, this person you found, this, this young entrepreneur you found, and you gave him advice, you mentored him, but you didn't give him any money, any year, he became a millionaire. Tell us, Correct. just walk us through, how did this actually happen? So it started from, I, when I was public CEO, your inbox is filled with hate. This sucks, we're suing you, here's a problem. You wake up every day, you don't know what's wrong, but you're gonna find out. Uh, and you're the, that's what your day's like. When I wrote Disrupt You, I literally get what I call love letters. I get emails every day of people how it's transformed their lives and allowed them to live the life that they want. But occasionally I get an email from a young person that says, I can't do this. Hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'm not a millennial. How am I not reaching? What if I try this Pygmalion experiment? What if I, just find somebody and, and do it. So uh, I found this young man and, uh, you know, on paper, he's everything going against him. You know, he's more likely to be incarcerated than become a millionaire. And, and yet I believe that everybody has this in them. So the first thing that I had to do and the first truth of the 12 truths in future proofing you is you have to have a growth mindset. You have to believe. And I didn't have time in this one year constraint that I set up as, a, as, as my challenge to have him organically build self-confidence. So as he did, found out the same time the readers did, I didn't tell him until we read the book, I lied to him in our first meeting. There's a psychological effect called the Pygmalion effect. A professor went to school, tested all the kids and told the teachers, these three students would be super learners, super achievers. And at the end of the year, those three students excelled. Why? Because the professor lied. Hmm. He picked names out of a hat, but if you tell the teachers that they're special and tell the kids that they're special, they'll act special and become special. So I told Vin Clancy, this young man that I interviewed over a hundred candidates and he was the only one with all the attributes to be a self-made millionaire. <laughs> and even if he didn't believe it at that moment, he thought if this old successful dude believed that he'd go along with it. By the end of his first month, when he had made $60,000, he literally could have walked to Europe without a plane. He could have walked on water. He, he embraced it. And the proof came midway through his story. His business got knocked like a sucker punch. Nothing of his fault. And I figured, okay, a book about a guy making half a million dollars and he'd tap out, you know. And at the end of that month's 
mentoring session, his goal for the month was to make 100 grand. And he came in dejected. I knew what had happened to the business. He only made 96,000. <laughs> and I'm laughing inside. If he could see Vin from six months ago being depressed that he only made 96,000 in a month, the transformation was permanent. And that's what I mean by future proofing. He took the next year off, not because you can live the rest of your life off a million dollars, but he now knows he has the skills that at any time he can do what he wants to do. And now he has multinational clients. He's, he's working for the big guys. I also yeah, made him get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Um, so you talk in Future Proofing You that being an entrepreneur is teachable. I, I think that's one of your sort of key Absolutely. messages. So I know you're a professor or you teach uh, classes in, in you know, higher you know, university learning. How, how do you teach kids to be entrepreneurs? So first you have to unteach that they were told that they can't. My first book, Disrupt You, was based on the premise that everybody thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing themselves. And if you can mm. show people that that voice that says you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not this, you're not that, if you can change that voice, if you can change your own conception of yourself, changing the world is easy. You know, as Henry Ford said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> so I have an exercise that I start with the students of write down three problems a day and do this for 30 days. It sounds simple. Your first day, you got traffic, you got this, you got that. After day two or three, most people are like, I don't have any more problems because we just accept life the way it is. You're not looking at the moment by moment annoyances because if you focused on those, life would be insane. But when you see those moments, they, you can then start thinking of solutions. Uh, one of my favorite examples in Future Proofing You was a mom. It's the middle of the week. Every mom can relate to this. Your child's in middle school. They're doing their poster for their project that they have to show in class tomorrow, and they mess it up. And they're crying. Get me another piece of poster board, please, please. And you schlep back to the store. But before you're going to go through this again, this mom took a yardstick and made little fine lines across the poster board. And in the morning, she's like, why is it nobody sells poster board with lines on it? She calls her sister, make a long story short, they get a patent for it, they go to the poster board company and they now make about $5 million, no employees, no anything. It starts with the problem. Every semester with the brightest college kids at the top universities in the country, there's always some student that comes up with the deliver food to the dorms business. Hmm. And I'm like, yeah, good, it's a business, but it takes the same effort to build Uber Eats as it does to deliver food to the dorms. So what's the size of your market? You know, How many people can you solve for? And we're all interconnected. So you can build a global business from anywhere. And what the pandemic also showed us is you don't have to hire the best people within five, 10 miles. You can hire the best people on the planet. And they may live in a, a, a place where it costs less to live in, and work for less. So. There's never been this much opportunity. We're going to come back in just a minute with more from Jay Samet. Are you a small business owner paying too much in tax? My name is Mike Jezoshek, and I'm a CPA and host of the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast. What I want to introduce to you is our tax minimization program. All too often, we see small business owners when they think of tax, think preparing and filing tax returns instead of tax planning. That is why we launched the Tax Minimization Program. The goal of our program is to make sure that small business owners are paying the least amount in taxes as legally possible. As part of our program, you'll have access to a library of tax strategies along with implementation guides. So not only do you get to understand a tax strategy, but you'll have the guide on how to implement it in your business today. You also have unlimited access to our team to ask general tax questions. Have a tax strategy you want to run past us or a tax situation that came up, feel free to reach out to our team. We also do monthly group training sessions and have a private Facebook group and so much more. To join our tax minimization program, go to taxsavingspodcast.com forward slash tax. That's taxsavingspodcast.com forward slash tax and be on your way to saving the most taxes as legally possible. This episode of Winning on Main Street is brought to you by Thrive. 
the end-to-end -end client experience platform that includes everything small business owners need to meet their customers' expectations. Thrive's award-winning and fully mobile interface delivers technology previously reserved for big business to the fingertips of small business owners nationwide. Thrive's built specifically for small business, but there's nothing small about what it can do. Thrive handles your entire customer experience, helping business owners reach more customers, stay organized, get paid faster, and generate online reviews, all from a single device or screen. To learn more about Thrive, visit winningonmainstreet.com and click on Get a Demo. When it comes to software to run your business, there's no comparison. Check out Thrive today. You talk in your book, um, this is, I guess, more than disrupt you, about pivoting, that many uh, businesses need to pivot, that, uh, in fact, there's many famous startups, names we've all heard of, that started as something else that didn't work. Yeah. And the founders pivoted successfully to create something huge. Can you talk about that? So, so most people would expect when I talk to huge audiences and lecture all over the world, that when somebody pitches my, an idea, I'll go, oh, that's a great idea. Here, I'm willing to tell almost anybody listening, your idea sucks. It really does. And I don't even have to hear it because ideas come from the outside. It's not till you get deep into it, deep into where you have the insights that no one sitting on the sidelines would have learned. So my go-to example is a great one. For those people that think dating was always swiping with your thumb, there was actually online dating before that. And before broadband, it was a still picture. You went to a website, the person's picture looked good. You wrote something, wrote back and forth, la-di-da. When broadband came out, three guys had a genius idea. The company was called TuneIn Hookup. What if we have videos so you can hear the person, see their personality? They're going to make a fortune. Great interface. They, they, they're, they're, they're counting their millions in their mind. The first dating video, you can't make these stories up, is a guy in front of the elephants at the zoo talking about why you should go out with them. Hey, ladies, nothing sexier than a guy in front of the elephant cage, right? Well, there was a tragic flaw with their business plan. No one wanted to date these losers on tune and hook up, but they looked at the data and data has no ego. Data will never steer you wrong. And they saw something that wasn't in their business plan. Nobody wanted to date these people, but they sure as hell wanted to show all their friends these videos. So they changed the name of Tune and Hook Up to YouTube and became billionaires without a penny in revenue. You know, Twitter was a music site. I can go on and on and on. So as an investor, somebody that's raised hundreds of millions of dollars for startups, you're not always investing in the idea. Mm -hmm. You're investing in the team. Is mm -hmm. this a team? And if it's a team that has failed before, they're more bankable mm -hmm. because they've learned, they've overcome. When you fail, you don't end up where you started. You either earn or you learn, but either mm. way, you're in a better shape. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to explore that failure thing because failure is something we're taught, uh, you know, kind of throughout our lives to be afraid of, to be embarrassed about, you know, you, 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 you know, it's not, it's a dirt, it's a bad word. It's not a good word. And yet you embrace failure. You, you, you talk glowingly yeah. about failure. In fact, one of your, I think one of your 12 truths is failure is great. So yeah, well, you will fail your way to the top. Okay. Think of a toddler. A toddler doesn't stand there one day and go today. I shall walk across the room. Mm. No, they try it. They stumble. They figure out what doesn't work. They get up, they do it. And eventually they walk. A video game, you don't sit down and four hours later go, yay, I solved it. I got, got uh, Donkey Kong to the princess. <laughs> you hit an impossible obstacle and you hammer on it until you get past it, only to discover there's another impossible obstacle. Well, that's what a career is. You figure out what doesn't work. I've had a mantra with people reporting to me, whether it was at big companies where I have hundreds of thousands of employees or when I sit in an empty room and start something. When you report to me, I tell you two things. One, you don't work for me, I work for you. Tell me what you need to do your job. If I don't get it for you, you know, then it's my fault. And number two, if you report to me, if you work for me for a year and you do not make a mistake, I will fire you. Because not making a mistake means that you're not trying and figuring out new stuff. In the 21st century, there's only one competitive advantage any company has, and that's getting insights from their customers faster than the competition. Mm. And here's the advantage of startups. 
these big companies have silos of divisions competing with each other and each insecure executive trying to focus on self-preservation of their empire. They don't share data. I mean, I can't out these guys on a podcast, but it's amazingly dysfunctional. And I also tell my, my grad students this. I said, your first job you go to is going to be the most effed up dysfunctional place you can imagine until you get your second job. Um, <laughs> so as a startup, you know all the data. You have a small team, you can move faster. I've sat in an empty room and turned things into a hundred million dollars in a billion. I've seen the pattern and that can be taught, but it all starts with those same basic premises. You know, don't fall in love with your idea. Try to destroy your idea. Try to find everybody that will tell you what's wrong with it and kill it. You know, more entrepreneurs are, are, are ruined by kindness. And when you find that idea that can't be killed, what I call the zombie idea, then go to raise money, then get a team. Because here's what's going to happen. If you don't do those steps ahead of time, you're going to get a bunch of money, get a bunch of people. Guess what? You're going to find out that the idea doesn't work after you've spent your capital. I took over a company that uh, had one month less left of payroll. They had 30,000 in revenue. They'd been through $8 million. The board had called me in. Nobody ever calls me when they're having a good year. And I looked at what they were doing and I saw the crux of something great. 18 months later, sold the company for $200 million instead of shuttering the door. So it's really about starting with that positive mindset, embracing uh, failing, and also understanding the function of fear. You mentioned fear. Hmm. I hate these gurus that tell people fear isn't real because then it makes you feel real insecure that you have fear. Nobody <laughs> else does. Everybody else can overcome fear. Guess what? You cannot. Biologically, it is impossible to overcome fear. Our core, the center part of our brain, the lizard brain, has a fight or flight response. That reflex happens in a nanosecond before any conscious thought. Athletes tap into that fear to get adrenaline to flow. And that mm. adrenaline actually does give you physical super strength so you can set these world records. So if you have a fear of failing, a fear of embarrassment, a fear of losing your money, losing other people's monies, all those fears, they're real. But if you're walking down the sidewalk and an 18 wheeler is barreling towards you, honking its horn, the brakes are out, are you? thinking about how embarrassed you're going to look jumping? Are you thinking about losing money? You're thinking about losing the only life that you have. So what that means is you can prioritize fear. And so if you keep at your forefront that going to a job that just pays you enough to show up and not to care, that doesn't let you live in a lifestyle that you deserve, that you're trading a day, a week, a month, you're trading your entire life for what? Mm -hmm. That's the fear you should be afraid of. And if you don't believe me, find your grandparents, talk to a senior citizen, ask them their biggest regret in life. And it's not anything they failed at. It's what they failed mm. to try. Right. So mm. now harness that fear and turn the table. Whoever you're trying to sell to has those same fears. Now you know what motivates them. So in those first few minutes of that meeting, you have to get them in a fear response. And I don't mean mafioso, like buy this or I'm going to beat you up, you know? <laughs> I remember sitting across the table from the CEO of Pepsi. This was one of those meetings, life-changing for my career. I'm a young kid. It's the most important thing. I've researched everything. I'm ready for any question. But for the CEO of Pepsi, I'm the only thing between him and going to lunch. <laughs> this is not a priority to him. But very quickly, I thank him for seeing me today because tomorrow I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Wait, he's going to my competition? The competition does this and the board finds out I had the chance to do this. I lose my job. What's this kid talking about? See how it changes the dynamic? Yeah. He's not thinking about lunch anymore. Yeah. I, on your discussion about entrepreneurship and, and, and how people get started, one of the things I found interesting is this idea that people, young entrepreneurs want to keep it a secret. They have an idea. They want to keep it a secret. They don't want to tell anybody because they think their idea is so brilliant. God forbid I should tell anybody and they'll steal the idea. What's your view on that? Oh, do I laugh at that? Sign the NDA, sign this, sign that. It's such a great idea. I could tell, tell you all the great ideas that just got funded or about to be funded or trying to get funded. I could stand in 
in Grand Central Station, New York. I could yell them at the top of my lungs, but you know what? It takes work. Nobody's running around and going, I'm going to steal your idea. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. So there's nothing to really keep secret. Now, at a certain stage, mm -hmm. the first person you will educate when you hit the market is your competition. But in most times, the competition has an arrogance and is looking at their other giant dinosaur competitors. I was, you know, when Netflix came along, Blockbuster, as we all famously know, owned the world. But Netflix wasn't an internet company. It was a mail DVDs in the mail flicks. But they didn't name their company Mail DVDs in the Mail Flicks. They said they were going to go to the internet. They gave their top secret in the name of the company, and no one cared. And you see this again and again. You know, Sony, you know, which I was brought in to try to save and was unsuccessful at. Sony had all the equipment. They owned the Walkman space. They saw the iPod, mm -hmm. but Sony's divisions, the Walkman guys were not allowed to make anything with a hard drive because that was the bio computer division and the bio computer division wasn't allowed to make anything that played music. So what they're basically saying is we'll go out of business. Those are the opportunities. Um, and it's so much more fun to sit in that empty room and create something to literally be Midas. And I talk about a future proofing world. People don't understand where money comes from. When they mm. hear that somebody could become a self-made billionaire and then the pandemic, it accelerated. It's actually about every 26 hours now, there's somebody that makes their first billion. And it's not this zero sum game where I buy a banana for a dollar and sell it to you for $2 and that's how you make money. It's you create money out of thin air. I start a new company, I sell you 10% for 10,000, what do I now have? I have 10,000 in cash and 90,000 in stock. 90,000 that didn't exist before, but I can hire people with that. I can buy companies with that. I could trade with that. That's where wealth comes from. Now you can understand how Jeff Bezos could lose money year after year after year after year for a decade and come out the backside of that major amount of failing in air quotes to be the richest man in the world. Yep. Why don't we teach that? A lot of the people who listen to our show are typical small businesses, plumbers, dry cleaners, lawyers, auto repair shops. How would you say to somebody who's running one of these more everyday local businesses to apply your lessons around disruption? Well, first of all, every business that you just mentioned is a high-tech startup. Mm. You have to think of every business as a high-tech startup. How do you find your customers? How do they find you? How do you market? How do you do everything? If I would ask you what over the past decade was the most successful high-tech startup, you would think Apple, you would think Facebook, you would think Google. No, the answer, Domino's Pizza. When Domino's decided to be app-centric, most of their employees work in IT now. They knew what customer tastes were, where they were, they could test market, they could get those insights faster, quicker. You need to figure out how to run your business on data. Too many small mom and pops focus all their energy working in the business, not to work on. So the number one startup that fails in the U.S. is a restaurant, okay? Restaurants usually start with, man, I've got the greatest barbecue recipe. I'm going to open a restaurant. The least important part of a restaurant's success is the food. True. So there was a guy who said, I want to start a restaurant. I don't want it to fail. And he tried to take a data-centric approach. Why do restaurants fail? Number one, too many items on the menu. If you have 50 items and nobody orders the fish, there goes your profits. So he said, I'm going to open a restaurant that only sells three items. Number two, it turns out humans are really annoying. They like to all eat at the same time. So if you serve, put two people at a table that could see four at lunch, you can't monetize and make that money. So rule number two, you're going to sit with strangers. I'm only going to serve full tables and you'll wait at the bar until there's enough people to do a table. So the bar tab goes up. So now he has a foolproof system for why restaurants fail. Now you come up with what's a concept of a restaurant under which those constraints would work. And for the past half century, Benny Hanna's has been killing it. He didn't say, I want to open a Japanese restaurant. He figured out a concept that would work with the constraints of why restaurants fail. So whether you're a plumber, whether you're an electrician, whether you're a plumber, how are people discovering you? How do you discover all the information and things that you spend money on? 
And how can you better target, better get to those people, customer acquisition costs at a lower thing, figure out lifetime value of a customer. All these big concepts that the big guys have apply to every individual business. And then the other thing I would say, if you're hitting it, if you've got a good product, a good service, you figured it out, why do you think your business is just for your town, your hamlet, your little corner of the globe? What stops you from being global and scaling? And learn how to get capital, learn how to get mentors to help you grow. Don't fly solo is one of the, the, the truths in, in future proofing you that the world is so dynamic, no one has the skill sets for everything that we do. So I try to teach people how to use LinkedIn to find mentors for each stage of their growth. Because mm. if you go back to the wealth is created by entrepreneurs, we're not fighting over the same limited pile. That mentality of abundance means that there are people that also believe in abundance and want to help and share and have the validation and joy. I learned as much from the mentoring of Vin Clancy as Vin learned. Hmm. I learned how this next generation sees the world, many ways more enlightened than our generation. It's just a different world that they're living in. Hmm. Wondering how you feel about schooling in general today. You had some strong words for how you were raised and, and your experience in school when you were a kid. Love to hear about that and, and how that translates into your views on schooling today. So the story you're referring to is the fact that I'm dyslexic. And yeah. I went to school in Philadelphia where we had three reading groups, <laughs> the Eagles, the Hawks, and the Mud Hens. And when you're labeled a Mud Hen at five years old, your prospects, I mean, aren't that good. Uh, it turns out one out of three CEOs is dyslexic. Uh, it's, a, it's a great superpower for thinking differently, uh, but I wasn't raised thinking that way. I have nothing against traditional education. Um, I do get in trouble at, at the university when I teach, when students drop out, because I had students do $100 million in the semester. Are they really supposed to graduate? No. And when the, the chancellor comes, I go, do you know who's going to be the alumni donating the most money? Those kids. Uh, but today we have a generation that graduates with a mortgage but no house. Mm. They're in debt, which makes them even more risk averse of trying something. Uh, so that system is broken. You, if you look at the studies, it's no longer true that a four-year degree makes you wealthier in life. Higher IQ doesn't make you wealthier in life. It all comes back to that persistence. Every product you've ever bought, every movie you've seen, every book you read was created by a stubborn person. So I do think you have to commit to lifelong learning. The fact that in this country, the majority of college graduates never read another book and coloring books are in the top 10 best selling of books. We're talking adult coloring books. As a, as a writer, you know, I'm like, would you like to have a better future and make a million dollars in a year or buy a macchiato with the same money? I mean, I don't understand the value. I was brought in to help revamp the government of Singapore. Singapore is an amazing country in, if you've ever read Machiavelli's The Prince, it says the best form of government is a benevolent dictator. They're far, hard to find. But here a guy took a swamp and turned into an amazing country. And I'm sitting with all the leaders and at this, the head of the country's library system comes up to me and goes, how can I get people to read more? And I go, well, tell me about your, your citizens. He says, the average citizen checks out six books a year. I nearly fell on the floor, mm -hmm. right? She wants to improve that. They already have the mindset of learning and growth. Uh, Leo Panetta, when he was an undergrad at Brown, did something with education that, that blew me away. And one of my sons went to Brown. He took away all required classes and all grades. So you first just say, wow, that just sounds like a party school. Nobody's going to learn anything. But no, it's the opposite. How does the geology department get any budget if no one's required to take rocks for jocks anymore? How does the English department get any students? Now it becomes a buyer's market. Students only take the classes where they feel they're gonna learn the most, where they hear it's the most dynamic professor. It raises the caliber and gets people wanting to learn. Mm. That's not how you would describe our public school system today. Yeah, yeah, interesting. How do you feel about vocational school? Uh, kids learning trades. It's the trades, we used to you know, segregate people off at like 14 and trade school, whatever. You know, 
I don't care how many ro robots are going to be taking over jobs. Somebody's got to repair them, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I don't care how wealthy you are, that plumbing still has to be fixed. So there's nothing wrong with a trade and a skill. You know, what we've lost is that apprentice mentality where you learn a craft and a trade because the trades are trading. So each person can find their own way. But if you're going to go into that craft, go into it with an entrepreneurial mindset. How can I turn this into the best opportunity for me? How can I scale what I'm learning and doing? And you'll see that there's no barriers to that growth. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. This is a fascinating discussion. I have a couple of questions I want to hit you with before we run out of time. Big companies, you you obviously are focused on entrepreneurs, but you talk a lot about big companies and how they're resistant to change and 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 some of the ways CEOs uh, you know fight change. And yeah, I think you say that uh, most CEOs would rather just buy a successful startup than try to create a startup within their company. Can you explain that? Sure. So I've been on both sides of it and I've been hired as an entrepreneur to change companies. So put your mindset in, 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 in a big company CEO for a second. Right, now that I'm not presently one, I can tell you the truth. They'll all give speeches that they care about the employees, they care about the shareholders, they share, care about the customers. Nothing could be further than the truth. CEOs actually aren't paid much money. What they are given is a huge dangling gold carrot is if you move the stock each quarter, they will back up the Brinks truck to your house and let you slather your body in hundred dollar bills. So what would you be thinking about? How do I hit that number that the board wants? So the easiest way is stop spending. So they've stopped spending on R and D. They stopped spending on new product. They're literally, you saw how all these giant companies needed government bailout. The second there's a one month blip in the economy because they're all maximizing to hit that number. So a CEO, could spend three years building a new product, or he could just write a massive check and get the results right now. And he gets the credit for that lift. So that's why you see startups being bought for crazy amounts of money. And I've sold companies into that game. If you're starting a company, think of who the acquirer is and that'll help you make some of the decisions. But in our limited time, I do wanna say, if somebody's listened this far into the show, then you're serious about change. I'm not selling anything. I don't coach, I don't sell t-shirts, there's, there's nothing. But I do have free workbooks for both Disrupt You and Future Proofing yep. You on my website. You download them today, you can start mapping out your life and your future. It's, it's jsamet.com. Um, but that's my only plug. Yeah, no, I saw those and those, those, are, those are great, as, as are both of the books. Um, and just uh, you know, finishing on the idea of, of how companies should be different. So when you were a CEO or if you were a CEO again, how would you approach it differently to foster innovation within your company? Well, people do what they're rewarded for. Mm. So you have to set up a system that encourages it. I, I was running the world's largest music company when Napster hit and was crushing everything. And they were desperate, the CEO, CFO, they all want to keep their jobs. Top line revenue across the industry went in half. There's no way you're hitting your numbers. So all they could plead is, People, you know, you got to make your numbers. They had no answer. So I went to them and I said, listen, here's your goal. Here's a stretch goal. If my division can hit this crazy number, will you double everybody's salary? And they go, absolutely, because it was insane. So I spent the entire year. I took a picture of the CFO. I put him on the wall, made one of those charity thermometers under him that you fill in each week. And it was called Make Tony Smile. And every week, that's all we focus on. And guess what? At the end of the year, everybody made twice as much money in I division, and the rest of the company hated our guts. That's great. That's great. So it's all about goals and incentives. Yeah, it's about, about alignment. Mm. You will find that things will succeed best when everyone is aligned. So one of the things that I told Vin when he had a client, he was doing marketing. Somebody pays you 5000 or whatever a month. You're making them a million dollars. Why not say to them at that date, if I can make you $2 million, will you give me 10% of that? And the person will go, sure. So put it in writing. Now you're alignment. And who wouldn't want somebody working their butt off? And so you can always find ways in a company or in a startup. At a bare minimum, if I hit your goals, does my contract automatically get renewed? You know, 
build in. So deal structure is something we get into in Future Proofing You because you can work hard or you can work smart. Hmm. Well, fascinating stuff and uh, incredible story about how you took this young uh, person and created a, a millionaire uh, or they enabled them to do that. So the book is uh, Future Proofing You, 12 Truths for Creating Opportunity, Maximizing Wealth, and Controlling Your Destiny in an Uncertain World. And I also recommend Disrupt You, Jay's prior book, and you can find all this out at jaysamit.com, J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T.com. Thank you so much for your time, Jay. This was really enlightening. An honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And if you like today's podcast, give us a five-star review and please tell a friend or colleague to subscribe. Until next time, make it a great week. Thank you.